Well, hey, everybody. Uh, sorry for starting a second late there, but welcome again to uh, Inside the President's Cabinet. We're going to get going with a wonderful, wonderful, amazing, brilliant, magical guest, uh, Paul Brandis. Hi, I'm Marty Mangello, and hosting you one more time here at the United States Presidential Culinary Museum for Inside the President's Cabinet. I'm continuing to show you what we do with China cookery and food, as well as growing and planting at Camp David and the White House, all to prevent poisoning, nuclear chemical and biological attack, as well as bugging, spying and tapping, and walking these grand halls loaded with artifacts and antiques. I've got hundreds of stories about the guests we cooked for and who slept over, and who broke a bed, and who wasn't invited or even lied to, and as one of the only few who ever managed the Camp David Resort and Conference Center, as well as being a White House chef, butler, housekeeper, and bartender, I'll show you the hidden retreat the presidents fished at, rode horses, enjoy rock climbing, and paintball in the woods. Now training for nuclear blast, war, and launch as part of my military duties at times, I showcase other elements of presidential service, like Air Force One, Marine One, the presidential yachts and rail cars, and what it's like to be a chief inside of the nuclear bunker of Orange One. I'm Marty Mangello, and this is Inside the President's Cabinet. Well, if we're not scared yet after that, Paul, then we should be. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty good. I, I I am so delighted to have you. Uh, the last time we were together was for the PBS television special on WHUT. We're coming back up there. Uh, we're inviting you to lunch, of course, and uh, that'll be September 19th, Sunday, September 19th at the Grand Hyatt. Uh, of course, it's on us. And today we were going to talk about your latest book, uh, Everybody, Mr. Paul Brandis, the author of Jackie. Uh, four books now, Paul, right? Uh, that's right. The first one, uh, my first book in 2015 is called Under This Roof. It's a collection of stories about not just the White House, but the presidents who lived there, particular rooms, and some of the historic events that happened in those particular rooms. And then another book is on uh, daily events in presidential history uh, every day of the year, a similar book for military history uh, events for every day of the year. And then my most recent book came out, uh, I guess, about a year ago. It's a biography of Jacqueline Kennedy. You know, there's no shortage of books about Jacqueline Kennedy, obviously, but this one covers uh, kind of a, a part of her life that has not gotten uh, all that much attention, the period between her two marriages. Everybody knows, of course, that she was married to John F. Kennedy, obviously, uh, and Aristotle Onassis in 1968. But the five years in between when she was on her own, uh, I think is a, one of the most fascinating periods of her life. And that's what uh, that book focuses on. It, it really is. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention your excellent podcast. I, I hold myself out to be a decently remunerated presidential historian to do the keynote speeches that I do. Um, online or on stage. And I listen to your podcast and I take notes and I'm learning uh, <laughs> the, your podcast. If anyone has not listened to Paul's podcast about this book, Jackie, um, it is fantastic, fantastic listening pleasure. Well, thank you very much. It, uh, it, it, it's such a joy to be able to do that. And I did the interviews for that uh, in conjunction with the book, instead of just talking to people on the phone and taking notes, I just recorded all the calls, of course, and uh, that gave me the material for not just the book, but the podcast uh, as well. And uh, so I'm very gratified it's doing uh, really well. And just your, your your comments mean a lot to me. So thank you very much. Absolutely. I mean, the cool thing I, I would like to let people know is it's not just a bunch of slack jaws japping their mouths back and forth. Um, what you do, I, f I thought was very high speed. 
you actually have historic telephone calls between the president and between Jackie and LBJ and between the president and people he would call. And, and then yeah. you have other recordings. Could you, you tell us about those, some of the recordings and how you got those? Well, a lot of it is in the public domain. It's at uh, these presidential libraries, of course, the Kennedy Library and then uh, the Lyndon Johnson Library. So a lot of it is uh, publicly uh, available, which was just a great thing. That's all the all these libraries, as you know, are run by the National Archives and uh, it's all open to the public. And if you can know what you're looking for and know how to search through the archives, it's just a treasure trove of material. But then it's also helpful to actually know an archivist or two at each of these places who can, you know, help you. It sort of speeds up uh, the process. And then as with any a book, when you're writing a book, it's really a collection of, you know, a hundred other books that you consult for little uh, anecdotes and uh, things here and there. So it's sort of a combination of all of that publicly available material, uh, anecdotes from uh, other books, but also the original interviews that you do. So those three mm -hmm. things, when you put them together, uh, put them into a, a blender, if you will, and hit puree, hopefully out will come uh, an interesting book. Absolutely. I mean, uh, some of the calls were very personal in nature. For yeah. instance, I couldn't believe that that they recorded a phone call between LBJ and, and Jackie offering her to utilize the jet. And then she said, well, gosh, that would be a huge waste of taxpayers money, LBJ. And, and he said, no, no, it wouldn't. You know, um, just magical, magical conversations and recordings. What about some of the other recordings that you guys play? Well, some of the, you mean of the other uh, presidential recordings? Well, some of them were, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think some of the most interesting ones were in the immediate aftermath of the assassination when Jackie was just uh, just reeling from the shock of what had happened and Lyndon Johnson being very solicitous. He was always checking in on her. Are you okay? Do you need anything? want to come over for dinner with Lady Bird and I just all the time mm -hmm. uh, inviting her and just, you know, laying on kind of the Texas uh, schmaltz a little bit. And I think she appreciated it. But after a while, uh, she started to get uh, tired of Washington and all the reminders of the White House. And so she, yeah. she never went back to the White House until uh, 1971. Uh, and that was a private visit, nobody knew about it, to look at the unveiled portraits of her and her late husband. She simply could not go back to the White House because it was just uh, so painful uh, for her. So she never, the Johnsons were always inviting her to events and dinners and this and that. She never went. It was uh, not antipathy toward the Johnsons. She liked them, uh, but it was just too painful for her to go. In fact, uh, in the year when a year or so that she remained in Washington before she moved to New York, she instructed her uh, drivers wherever she was going, uh, "Don't take a route that will enable me to see the White House." They, mm -hmm. she made them, she made them take different routes through Washington that made sure she couldn't even see the White House. That's how painful right. it was. Right. Right. And unbelievable. Um, you know, you had Clint who was interviewed several times and took part of the, the podcast for the book. And uh, we're going to take a look at the book here in a second. But um, I couldn't believe that he was the only bodyguard that they had for her and the children. And all those people crawling all over the house and bushes. And somebody you said actually uh, was able to steal the number off the house. And who knows where that is today in somebody's private curio yeah. cabinet that they think yeah. is funny, but systemically terrorized her. And, you know, it's just, it really makes you think about the things that Harry says today, like Prince Harry about security for him and Megan and the, and the baby and living in LA. And when you are this well known, there are people looking to blow you away with a pistol like John Lennon, just so they could become famous. Uh, Rainier, our daughter was asking me last night, like, why do people want to do that, daddy? And I was like, so that they can become famous, honey. That's really the main reason. Well, without uh, delving into the, the assassination itself, which is a subject of just uh, endless 
uh, controversy, much of which I, in my judgment, is overblown. If you have a new book coming out that's uh, largely about the uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and the motivations and this and that and his uh, pathetic short life, and uh, one part of his, uh, he, he, he dreamed of being famous. He wanted to do something that would land him in the history books. He was looking for notoriety and attention, and uh, boy, he sure did uh, find it. Um, but in terms of, you know, security for Jackie, it's true that after the assassination, can you imagine what she went through? I mean, she saw her husband murdered uh, right before her eyes. She was this far away from him when uh, he was shot, looking into his uh, face. Absolutely uh, trauma on a level that really no one can uh, no one except to those who've been in just uh, the worst parts of war could uh, possibly uh, empathize with. She was terrified. Uh, she had nightmares every night for months. Uh, the same nightmare, too, over and over again. And, of course, it wasn't a nightmare. It was something that had actually happened uh, to her. And to your point, after she left uh, the White House, uh, a lot of her security just uh, uh, she had uh, a couple she had some security uh, the kids had security but the house they were living in they lived in kind of a borrowed house for about two months and then she bought a house across the street but it wasn't exactly the white house there was no fence you could walk up uh, to the front porch you mentioned the whoever stole the yeah you know it was just horrible people could look in the windows uh, she said she had to shut the drapes to just uh, change her clothes. There was no privacy. People were always calling for her or John or Caroline to come out. Absolutely terrifying, particularly in the wake of what she went through. She had post-traumatic stress syndrome, which really wasn't uh, uh, clinically diagnosed. That was a term that didn't really exist in 1963 or 64. It really didn't. PTSD didn't really exist until 1970 when it was defined, but that's clearly what she had, and she had it for the rest of her life. She simply learned to, uh, you know, she she, de she she dealt with it, but she never really uh, got over it. Yeah, yeah, just crazy. And even somebody like Clint going out there, I mean, if there's 10, 15 people, and you mentioned they started up the tours, and, and I had a question about that, um, so was that like the Hollywood tour bus that you ride that drives through the neighborhoods? Or were those walking tours to go see the the first lady's home? Well, they were largely buses. These uh, huge, yeah, you know, I guess a Greyhound or a Trailways bus, or you know, whatever that kind. Of, you can picture, you know, how big those are, and they can hold yeah. like 40, 50 people or something. And uh, she was the most famous woman in the world, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose, along with. Queen Elizabeth, and I think the biggest uh, female movie star of that era was Elizabeth uh, Taylor. Uh, Jackie, in my judgment, was above both of them in terms of uh, worldwide uh, fame. And you could pay, I don't know what these tours cost, but a couple of bucks way back then. You could get on the bus sure. drive right up to the right up to the sidewalk. And you usually people, can hear the, the person in there on the microphone, too. Um, uh, I, I went... Went on the tour in Hollywood, of course, uh, it was $20 or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and people would get out and uh, some people made a day of it. They said, well, I said, well, if I just don't wait here all day, one of them will, you know, come out. And some people sold, you know, set up a lemonade stand and souvenirs and that kind of thing. It was really <laughs> just a circus. Oh wow. And Jackie was upset and she had to apologize to the neighbors and everything. It was just, it was a mess. So that helps explain uh, why she moved to New York in uh, 1964. It's not just the lack of privacy and the security concerns, but again, being in Washington with all of the painful memories that it had, it's certainly uh, easy enough and understandable enough that she would want to flee all that, which she did pretty quickly. Sure. And and not a lot of people know that, you know, uh, when a first lady remarries, they lose all protection under American law. And I've often mentioned that during our tours here at the museum with the Jackie exhibit. Uh, but one thing that that I've never been able to corroborate and maybe maybe you have seen it in your research, but 
was the supposed comments from Jackie that, well, it's actually a good thing because Ari has his own protective detail with his own snipers up on the roof and his own bodyguards. And, you know, I've become quite concerned um, after Robert was killed and, you know, we've received letters that the children are next. Um, I don't know if they've penetrated the Secret Service, if there's payoffs. I, I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but it might actually be good to to have a separate protective detail. And, and if we're floating around the ocean on a, on a huge ship, that's kind of difficult to attack as well. I'm not always walking around and driving around New York that way. So what, what would be your comments about that within your research? How, how accurate or off base is that? Uh, well, the threats to her were certainly real and the threats to Caroline and John were certainly real. And in the time they were living in New York, and I write about this, there are a couple of instances that I mentioned, Marty, where uh, you know, at one point they were coming out of church one Sunday on the Upper East Side and uh, some crazy woman went up to Caroline and grabbed her tried to haul her away and uh, Jackie understandably the you know the mother bear got upset and uh, uh, and the Secret Service agent John Walsh who was her principal Secret Service agent until she got married uh, fought the woman and took Caroline away but it was obviously a terrifying uh, thing so there were uh, instances like that that were uh, that, that that scared the daylights out of her yeah you know, the good thing about living at uh, 1040 Fifth Avenue where she lived was that it was a very secure building. Uh, she continued to have Secret Service up until the time she married. Uh, she continued to have Secret Service in the building. There were obviously a uh, doorman in the building. They were very solicitous and protective of, of all their tenants, obviously, but particularly their most uh, famous uh, tenant. And when she married uh, Onassis, uh, in the wake of Robert Kennedy's assassination, which you just uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. the issue was that uh, uh, she'd be giving all that up. But when she married Onassis, obviously, uh, he had a private island, which was quite secure. He had a private, uh, he, he literally had a private army of about 75 uh, heavily armed uh, men, which exactly. is much more security than she would ever get from the Secret Service. So, exactly. uh, uh, and again, she was terrified after uh, Bobby's murder. And of course, you heard that uh, Sir Ann Sirhan uh, is one yeah. step freed. He hasn't been freed yet. He still has to go through a few more hoops, but uh, he might be, he might get out. I don't, uh, I don't think he should, but he might. No, I'm not an advocate for that either. So, well, let me show your, your book. Uh, I did see that in the news and I want to show folks, um, this particular book, uh, Where to Buy, uh, of course, um, we have the Simon and Schuster site, and I will bring that up for everybody. But then I do also, I know a lot of people love Amazon. Can so, I interrupt uh, just for a second? I'm actually in a, I'm actually in a, a hotel, and my wife is knocking at the door. I'll be back in oh 10 God, seconds. Yeah, let her, please let her in, the, the poor woman. So this is actually... Uh, the book right here at Simon and Schuster, everybody. And uh, if you want to get a chance to see Jackie, her transformation from First Lady to Jackie O by Paul Brandis, uh, here it is here. Uh, also for sale at Barnes okay. and Noble Bookshop. Oh yeah, I'm just uh, showing folks the book here. Can you see that, Paul? I, I can. Yeah. Yeah, I was saying uh, uh, available at IndieBound and 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 Bam, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Bookshop. Everywhere and, books are sold, as they say. Yes. So uh, 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 please feel free, guys. Um, also, let me jump over here to Amazon. And if anybody wants a personally signed copy, we can arrange that. Okay, a personally signed copy. And what is the best way? Can I? Can I? type that in should they contact you on twitter or they can they can send me an email it's uh, p brandis at uh, gmail okay p I'm brandis yeah okay p brandis at was it at yahoo or gmail uh either uh, gmail's better i think 
Okay, pbrandis at gmail.com, guys, um, if you would like an autographed copy. Uh, what are you selling it for, Paul? I see it here on Kindle and uh, um, hardcover 20, uh, paperback says 17. There's 10 used right now. Is there is well, there an extra I, handling charge on your end with shipping? Well, I, what I would do is, I mean, I have uh, I have books that the publisher gives me, and I would uh, and I would mail them from here. So I'll just do it at at cost, whatever the you know the book is like. What twenty dollars, and the shipping yeah. might be twenty five dollars. Probably about the I guess the right price of it. Yeah, and it, it, we can have a little listen here. Um, did you do you did this on audiobook as well? Uh, yes, I did an audiobook as well on uh, Kindle. Okay. And was this your first audiobook? My first audiobook. Well, this the first one, well, the first one that I've done. Yes, the, the I've I've never done one in my voice. I I hired through SAG AFTRA um an actor out of out of Hollywood. Yeah. And for my eighth book, she narrated it. So that was the uh what in 2019, that's the first time I ever did that. Let me see if I can play a little bit of this, Paul. And if you can okay. hear this, it make sure okay. I have the audio engaged. Okay. When Jacqueline Kennedy married Aristotle Onassis on Scorpios, his time all right, I'm gonna pause that. Were you able to hear that, Paul? I, I did. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that we have a lot of questions coming in. I want to make sure people can hear this. Uh let me play that for everybody. Any island retreat in the Ionian Sea off the western coast of Greece, the world was stunned. The headlines were vicious and full of betrayal. The reaction here is anger, shock, and dismay, said the New York Times. Jackie sells out, cried the Los Angeles Times. Jackie, how could you? asked a Stockholm paper. Jackie weds blank check, sneered a Fleet Street tabloid. And perhaps worst of all, Rome's ill messagero, JFK dies a second time. It was October 1968, not five years since the assassination of her first husband, President John F. Kennedy, and barely four months since her brother-in-law, Robert F. Kennedy, was himself gunned down in Los Angeles moments after winning California's Democratic presidential primary. Both murders shocked America and devastated Jackie to the core. The first robbed her of one husband, the second drove her into the arms of another. This book examines Jackie's life during the five-year period in between, bookended by her marriages to two of the richest and most powerful men in the world and several men in between. To the casual observer, John F. Kennedy and Aristotle Onassis were polar opposites. The former was tall, sophisticated, and charming, his movie star looks and quick wit made women swoon. The latter was short and squat, had the face of a gangster, and sometimes came off as greedy and abrasive. Such generalizations were not without merit, yet beneath the surface, both men were, in key respects, more similar than different. They were wealthy, hyper-competitive, power-hungry womanizers who stopped at nothing to get whatever and whomever they desired. Kennedy, the Pulitzer Prize-winning author who delivered some of the 20th century's most soaring speeches, could be, and often was, crude and vulgar and private. Onassis was often seen in almost thuggish terms, a selfish and narcissistic interloper who didn't belong. Yet the Greek tycoon was also, and critically seen by Jackie as, charming, gregarious, and not just in his native Greek and English, but in French and Spanish, languages in which she was also fluent. And friends, particularly women, mm -hmm. considered him a perfect listener. Thus, where some saw a rough, unpolished, and physically unattractive man, Jackie saw a man of culture, a lover of music and poetry. Aristotle Onassis made... So I'll just pause it right there, Paul, and say... Uh, excellently narrated, and I got to say, you don't pull any punches. You're about as bad as me. Uh, <laughs> I've raised the hair off of people's the back of their heads several times. This museum has been investigated twice by the White House General Counsel. Um, you know, I don't do anything inappropriate or that's untrue or without references. But when I heard you mention that uh, Ari had the bar stools. And he would have women sit at them and then tell them that, you know, 
uh, that bar stool is a, I had a whale penis to cover the bar stool. And you are sitting on the whale penis right now. Um, I, I was, oh my gosh. They would <laughs> oh. jump up in horror. Yeah. They would, they would jump up. And, and also, you mentioned Jackie's comments about all the nude women pictures that he had all over the yacht. Yeah, she didn't like that too much. Yeah, so uh, yeah, when, when we come back, guys, we're going to take a take a short break here for four minutes. When we come back, we're going to going to continue and finish up with our interview today. I promise um, I'm going to get answers for uh, these many questions coming in. I see uh, from New York, uh, Patty Frudenberg there. Thanks for sharing the insight. What would Mr. Paul say is his favorite chapter? We will be coming back to you, Patty, uh, when we get back. And uh, yeah. It, it is a bit nerve wracking. Um, she's commenting on the people climbing in the bushes and stuff. Oh, from Croatia, uh, Sania. Uh, she works in the Croatian government. Uh, Sania loves reading books. Um, she is constantly uh, have an, another novel in her hand. We'll take a photo with it from Croatia oh. and loves purchasing books. Uh, um, Patty, uh, yes, we just listened to the audible version of that. Oh, good. She enjoyed it. Okay. Well, we'll get an answer to um, your initial question when we come back, Patty. I think that's a good one. And guys, so you, I, we have more uh, more uh, questions coming in. So please just, just keep them coming in. We'll get them to Paul here in a second. Did you ever miss someone who has passed away? Now there's the Miss You Gram app, giving people a brand new way to tribute the lives of deceased loved ones or simply remember tender memories. This exclusive app is a user-friendly social media platform, giving people everywhere a respectable and comfortable place to create private or public memoriams. Miss you Gram has additional features like chat rooms and links to deceased databases and inspirational quotes. Users can also comment and connect on public public posts. Join us and keep memories alive forever. Everyone wants to be remembered. For more details and download on the Google Play or Apple App Store, visit miss-u-gram.com. Did you know that at least half of the world's population still does not have access to essential health services? One of the biggest problems in developing countries is the lack of medical monitoring devices. We have a solution. Kipuwex. Kipuwex is an easily attachable, lightweight IOMT device which continuously measures all the clinically relevant biomarkers vital to the assessment of your health. Kipuex uses smart algorithms to provide efficiently reliable measurements for healthcare professionals. The biomarkers can be monitored remotely anywhere and at any time with a mobile and web application. Kipuex is not limited by physical infrastructure and is suitable for professional use and in the future for home users as well. A simple user interface will let you choose which biomarkers you want to view and displays them on easy to read graphs. We here at Kipuex want to combat healthcare inequality and help millions of people around the world.
Hey, Chef Howder here. Want to tell you about my Amazon best-selling memoir cookbook, A Chef is Born, chock full of recipes, also ranked the 77th book of all time out of 99, according to the Book Authority. It's a good book, but it's better chef than you. Yeah. <laughs>everybody we are back again with paul brandis and a bunch of questions that had come in uh the most interesting of which uh from patty patty frudenberg up there in new york we appreciate your patronage we appreciate you uh being on uh every day of course uh patty is on clubhouse uh the largest creative group almost ten thousand members get on there every morning wow uh, and so, uh, boy, uh, would you be a great guest on Clubhouse? Are you familiar with with Clubhouse, Paul, from Apple? Uh, you know, I've heard of it, but I've never done. I would love to do it. I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled to hear about it. It's like the old time radio. There's nothing to see. It's just yeah. listening, and it's only voice. And they do a lot of different uh, sounds. You know, in the background. Uh, oh my gosh, they have the uh, applause. And too bad, so say <laughs> they have all the you know, let's like I mean, honest to goodness, like the 40s listening to the radio. Oh, yeah. And and you know, uh, it really is amazing to see Delano Johnson. He is the leader of the particular show that Patty is on, the house of creativity. Um, I think honestly, uh, Patty, he would be a great, uh, great guest uh, for the show. And to reach more people. Anyway, on to Patty's question there. Thanks for I should sharing. Inter- I, should, I should interview Patty for another book. So. Well, it'd be fantastic. Patty yeah. owns um, Miss You Graham, uh, the company with the app for the phone. And it's in case you miss people uh, and, and you would like to remember them. So Miss You Graham has a, a bunch of features like that. Uh, but I see that Patty's question is asking, Paul, what is your favorite chapter in writing the book? Well, I like the whole thing, but I think the um, I think the part that I really enjoyed most was writing about her interactions with uh, Greta Garbo, the famous uh, actress. And I think the reason is that uh, Garbo and uh, Jackie had an awful lot in common. Garbo, of course, in her time was probably, you know, in the 20s and much of the 1930s, uh, perhaps the most famous actress in the world. And at the very peak of her fame, she gave it all up, moved to New York because she wanted uh, security and anonymity. And of course, Manhattan is a great place for that. And uh, interestingly enough, that's the same reason Jackie moved to New York. Uh, security Mm -hmm. and uh, more privacy. And they actually uh, knew each other and became uh, pretty good friends. They actually had dinner in the White House nine days before the assassination. And then they reconnected in New York and uh, would often, uh, you know, have dinner together and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Just uh, fascinating. And another thing that uh, people might not know is that Jackie, of course, was very famous for the you know, the big sunglasses and sometimes the scarves that she would wear on her head for uh, anonymity. And Jackie was also famous for wearing uh, pants. She's one of the first women in New York uh, to wear pants. And of course, uh, if she wore them in New York, everything she wore was uh, copied. And uh, But she actually got all of those uh, fashion uh, hints from Garbo. Garbo was uh, she wore the big glasses and the scarves and she wore pants too. And so people think Jackie uh, was sort of the first there, but actually 
Greta Garbo was one of the trailblazers, and Jackie, mm -hmm. of course, being friends with Garbo, picked up on that herself. So I, I like the whole book, but I think that's one of the most. Uh, I, I, was, I was fascinated by that. It's amazing to see what was that restaurant that wouldn't allow women in that wore pants, but they said the only two that come in here wearing pants or slacks are these two ladies, Garbo. Yeah, it, or, it was or amazing. Kennedy. They wouldn't let. It was uh, they called Basque, which at the time was one of the more famous restaurants in New York. And uh, yeah, Jackie could get away with wearing pants there. Garbo could get away with it, but they would turn away other very prominent wealthy women. Mm -hmm. uh, the wife of Nelson Rockefeller, quite prominent. Uh, she said, they said, no, you can't come in in that. Uh, Bay Paley, the wife of the uh, very powerful chairman of CBS, same thing, no, you can't wear pants. This is Le Cote Basque, you can't wear pants in here. Yeah. But Jackie and Garbo uh, could do whatever they wanted. They were above it all. So it was just uh, just amazing. Unbelievable. And, yeah. and I know a lot of people mentioned to Jackie, you know, it's not just the men who are angered and enraged about you wearing the pants. There's also women, Jackie, who don't like it. So don't immediately think it's these men who are trying to control everything. There are women who do not appreciate it. And and just unbelievable, even with her trying to get a credit card in her name, I often have to tell people, um, you could not get a credit card with your name on it in those days. And, and they would have to call like a manager over and say, we may have a problem here with this woman um, does not want her husband's name printed on the visa card. So <laughs> I'm not really sure what to do. Uh, you know, you know, Paul, it'll take until um, the Clintons actually to get pants authorized in the White House. It was amazing. Oh, right? Yeah, Nancy Clark asks one day, our usher, the White House usher, she asks him, uh, listen, uh, Gary, we, we, I don't want to make like a problem, but um, there's a lot of people watching the first lady wearing the, uh, and he says, what, the what? The what? Slacks and things like that and pantsuits. And actually a bunch of these professional women, they're all smart, um, you know, and with degrees and their attorneys and and they're coming in here, Gary, wearing the pants. He's like, OK, so what is the problem? You said there was a problem, though. Um, she, she says, well, um, so I'm being asked. Uh, Nancy's passed away now, but but I used to do flowers with her, all, all types of stuff. She says, they're seeing them wearing the pants and they're asking, are they allowed to wear them also? Would they yep. be allowed to, to put yep. pants on? Yep. <laughs> so, so, well, do they put pants on already? She, well, yes, many of them do put pants on, but at only at home and out and thing, but never here. So I'm thinking like maybe we should develop a uniform, some type of guidelines. And Gary says, of course, absolutely, we would do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I understand they're seeing a lot of these very educated professional women with Hillary, and it's it's a bit obtuse. She moved the whole office. It's not over where it belongs in the East Wing. She's over here in the West Wing. And, yeah, they're being exposed to women that wear pants. So, yeah, absolutely, they can wear pants. Well, let's develop, like, some guidelines where they're going to be khakis or whatever, you know, and we'll just type up a simple... But it takes that long, Paul. It really does. And when you think about, um, you know, Jackie, and she wore pants in the White House, uh, not really in public, but uh, it was really after she left, all the other first ladies between uh, her and, as you say, Hillary Clinton, you know, they went back to wearing dresses. I mean, Lady Bird Johnson and Pat Nixon and Betty Ford and you know Nancy Reagan and so forth, uh, they all wore uh, dresses until uh, Mrs. Clinton came along. And now it's quite common, of course, but it really took mm -hmm. uh, Jackie to break the mold. She was obviously, uh, as I mentioned, the most famous woman in the world. Everything she wore attracted attention. Uh, her hairstyle, just everything. And uh, she was yeah. just, uh, copied the world over. So uh, in terms of pants, yeah, she and uh, Gar both first women uh, in New York to do it. That's what uh, Sania from Croatia said. Uh, Sania, by the way, I, I did mention that she's a very high up government official yeah. uh, in the ministry there for finance. Um, 
yep. said a great comparison between Jackie and Garbo. Yep. And uh, um, these people like Sunia will make you cry uh, when they tell you their impressions of the United States and freedom and having a constitution. Um, just a short few years into having Liberty Paul, uh, they they ferociously follow these things and and sometimes they know more about it than we do but yeah. but uh, when i heard that on your podcast i was like oh my gosh i never knew that uh, wearing pants with garbo into the restaurant unbelievable to to hear and i saw patty was a bit freaked out in new york about the credit card and and so when we say these people that you honor these women uh like jackie with your book paul um such a great job but kicking glass and we still have a little bit further to go with our wives and our daughters and our mothers that we love and our nieces. When women make about 79% of what a man is typically paid. Um, we all have wives. Your wife is a very professional lady in society and business. Very well known. Yes, yeah. You know, we want the best things for them. And my daughter is around here somewhere running around. Uh, the book she's working on is it's called uh, a night at the museum and, the night is crossed out. It's a life at the museum. This kid grew up in a museum her entire life with glass mm. cases. So I think these things are important for them to know uh, what, too. what they've gone through. Yep, I do too. I do too. Yeah, just to get this far. So, well, uh, thank you so much, Paul. Any parting uh, thoughts today? Um, I know we want to have you back because honestly, um, we we mentioned uh, uh, to the producers that we wanted to do all four of your books. So I, I view in my head, we have three more shows with Paul. Well, I'd be uh, delighted. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much, Marty, for the invitation. It's just a great uh, honor for me. And thank you to uh, Patricia. And I want to pronounce it right. It's Ksenia. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's tough. Senia Chipek. Sania, okay. Well, thank you very much, ladies, for those uh, great uh, questions. And uh, I, I hope to come back soon. So uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Uh, let me see if I missed one last question there from Sania. She said, yeah, Jackie inspires women even to today. Yep. An icon, no doubt. So the book is fantastic. Uh, how many pages is the book, Paul? It's a hardback, pretty thick. Um. Well, you got me there. I think it's, uh, I forgot, I think maybe about uh, 300, maybe? A little yeah, less, so 275, maybe? It's a significant read, yeah. Sania. It's a big, thick, hardback book with a beautiful dust jacket. But um, and, and like I said, Sania will often purchase people's books and take a photograph with it and blow it out to her massive, massive oh. network across Europe. Well, that'd be, uh, that would be... Wonderful. And uh, next time I come to Europe, uh, I will uh, buy her a, a drink anywhere she is, just to my way of saying thanks. Thank you. Yeah. She comes to the United States also. That you oh, might get, good. get that pleasure in D.C. Okay. She was here for the Global Blockchain Alliance uh, meeting, and we took her out to dinner in the Navy Yard restaurant there. So, oh, good. Okay. Paul, I'm going to run and say thank you again so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. thanks.